Chapter 7 Mokfawa Up, slave! snarled the taskmaster, prodding Misha Sai with his goad. The stocky young man groaned and tried to turn over, earning another sharp prod. In Falaji, the taskmaster repeated the order. Rakik! Kayim! Misha coughed through a dust-filled throat that he was awake, and he hauled himself to his elbows to prove it. The taskmaster moved on to the next slave as Misha blinked the dust from his eyes. His dreams had been wrapped up in darkness, utter and black. He was alone, all alone without Tukasia, Urza, or any of the others. They had abandoned him, and in that darkness of his dream they were singing, lovely singing, that issued from his green stone. But he had lost the stone as surely as he had lost the rest of his life. Misha blinked out the last of the darkness and knew that his waking world was little better than that of his dreams. He was in the camp of the Sawardi. He had been captured and claimed by them. He was property now. He was a slave. He was Rakik. After Takasia's death, he had fled northward, toward the cavern at Koilos. He didn't mean to at first. He had just fled. But his feet found their way into the desert and along the long shelf of the mountains, inevitably leading toward the Lost Canyon. The scrubby, succulent plants that etched out of their lives along the desert's borders provided him with life-giving water during the trek. Still, he was thin and weak when the Sawardi outriders found him. At first, Misha thought they were rescuers, friends from among the Falaji diggers who had come looking for him, sent by Amal or Hajar. But the riders who found him were tougher and crueler men than the diggers at the camp, hard men with wind-carved faces and no patience for outlanders found in their desert. They wore broad-brimmed flat helmets that marked them as Sawardi, each bronze helmet inscribed along the brim with the vows of courage and battle. The warriors dragged him back to their camp, but only because it was nearby. Otherwise, they would have simply killed him and stripped his body. They took his glittering stone as treasure as well, but they did not treat it as anything more than an attractive bauble. Misha had the strength to let out a weak shout as they pulled the bag containing the gem from his neck. That earned him an elbow to the face, a cuff intended both to silence and to train. The Sawari set Misha to work with the other slaves. Most were Falaji, captured from other tribes and held until proper ransom was established or proper loyalties to the Sawari were ensured. These captives were treated fairly well, as slaves go. There were a few other outlanders as well, hand scarble survivors of caravans that did not pay the demanded tolls for traversing Sawari land. These slaves the tribe worked to death. Of the seven other outlanders who had been among the slaves when he was first brought there three months earlier, Misha was the sole survivor. There were a few later additions, but they had died quickly. There had been no additional outlander slaves since then. The Sawari had apparently stopped taking them. So Misha worked as a slave. He built. He dug. He dragged heavy things. He did not ask questions. Another outlander had asked questions and his teeth were removed with a chisel. Misha slept when he was allowed. He ate what he was given, which was less than the Kadir's hounds received. And he dreamed. He dreamed of the darkness and the fractured power crystal singing to him. He tried to look for it, but he found he was too exhausted to move held captive in the prison of his own flesh. During the day, when he laid stone upon stone, or dug a new cooking pit, midden, or grave, he thought of his dreams. This day, he was digging a trench for some unknown reason. Occasionally, his spade struck a bit of odd metal from the age of the Thran, and he tossed it on the pile of crunched earth with the other garbage. As he dug and thought, Misha did not hear his name being called, not the first time, or the second. Only when a hand was laid on his shoulder did the stocky man react. Misha started and raised an arm to protect himself. No one touched an outlander with good intent in the Sawardi camp. Master Misha, it is you, cried Hajar. Misha looked up at the one addressing him and saw the young lean-faced digger from Tokasia's camp, the one who had accompanied him the night that everything fell apart. But this Hajar was wearing a Sawardi helmet, a pair of swords mounted on a harness across his back, and he was smiling. Are you all right? asked Hajar in Falaji. Misha waited a moment then nodded. He had no use for words for the past few months, and few spoke to him beyond simple orders. A shadow appeared on Misha's right. It was the taskmaster, who had fewer slaves to deal with over time, and kept his hold on his remaining treasures that much tighter. Do not speak with the Rakik, said the taskmaster sharply. Hajar laughed, and Misha realized that the former digger was taller than the one who ordered him about. Do you know who you have digging holes for you? Misha wanted to say that he enjoyed digging the holes, and Hajar should not take the one pleasure away from him, but the words were lost on the way to his mouth. This man is a great scholar, continued Hajar. He knows things no one other man knows. He has discovered secrets of the old ones, and you have him digging ditches. Hajar laughed again. Scholar, the taskmaster spat in the dust. That explains why he digs ditches so poorly. 
Now go away! Hajar shook his head. He should not be digging ditches at all. You're right, the taskmaster exploded. I expected him to die months ago. He is an outhunter and a slave. He works for me, Morak, the taskmaster, for the moment. You want him to work for you? Go to the Kadir. Hajar paused for a moment, then said, I shall. Try not to kill him before I return. And Hajar was gone, head held high, heading for the center of the camp. Misha dug energetically, but the taskmaster was displeased with his work. A sharp jab in the side with the butt end of the goad reminded the former scholar that he should not have talkative friends. Misha groaned under the blow and slowed only slightly as the ache spread through his body. He let the pain pass through him and resumed his digging. At the end of the day, the Sawardi held their communal dinner. The Kadir's tent was fed first, then the warriors, then the women and children, then the Kadir's dogs, and finally the slaves. And the Falaji slaves were fed before the outlanders, for there was a reason to keep the Falaji alive. Misha was chewing a piece of stale, mold-spotted bread when they came for him. Men in direct service to the Kadir, with their broad helmets and ornate necklaces of heavy gold. Ceremonial guards, the young man realized. The Kadir of the Sawari must be doing very well to thus equip his warriors. The guard spoke a few words, unheard by Misha, to mark the taskmaster, and the brawny master of slaves retired, grumbling to his own quarters. Then the guards half-marched, half-dragged Misha to the Kadir's tent, a broad, wax-colored pavilion lit from within. The soldiers stopped outside only long enough to remove the heavy hobbles that bound Misha's feet. Then they pushed him inside. The tent was soft and smoky. Braziers were lit around the perimeter, and Misha caught the scent of sandalwood and desert cedar wafting up from them, mixed with other pungent spices. The scent hurt his nose and made his eyes water, but it succeeded in dampening the stench of the Suwari themselves in these close quarters. The ground was covered with thick rugs woven from the wool of mountain sheep and stained with food and, in some places, blood. Great reclining pillows were scattered about. To either side of the room were the immediate relations of the Kadir, the Hangarons, the Courtiers, and the ambassadors from the other tribes. At the center of the tent was a platform raised and covered with slightly cleaner carpets. This was the Kadir's place. The Kadir was a massive man, thick-shouldered, thick-necked, and thick-headed. He was beginning to give in to the result of his own success. His belly spilled slightly over the belt, holding his robe shut. As Misha entered the tent, the Kadir was helping himself to a great bowl of shelled nuts. At one side of the Falaji leader was seated a similarly built, similarly dressed younger version of the Kadir. On the other side standing was Hajar. Misha dropped to both knees in the Falaji custom and waited for whatever would come next. The Kadir snorted down a handful of nuts. The slave dog of the desert is the one you speak of, Hajar? He asked in Falaji. His voice poured out the words like thick coffee. That he is, most eminent one, replied Hajar in the same language. And this is a scholar, you say? said the Kadir. A most respected one. And Misha noticed that the young version of the Kadir was not smiling. In fact, he looked bored. The Kadir leaned forward and stared at Misha. Doesn't look much like anything, even for an outlander. Laughter rippled among the courtiers, relations, and ambassadors. Do you judge your horses by their bridles? asked Misha. Or how hard they serve? He said it in a low voice, barely more than a whisper. It was a desert saying that he had learned from Amal, and the young man said it in perfect philology. He did not look up as he said it, he did not say it proudly or angrily, but he did say it. The room grew quietly. The Kadir shot Hajar a venomous look that seemed to melt the young man in place. And the Rakik speaks our language as well? The Kadir observed. Hajar bowed nervously. I said he was most learned in a number of fields. When the thin Falaji looked up, the Kadir no longer looked at him. Instead, he regarded the outlander through heavy-lidded eyes. You know the legends? asked the Kadir. Of the old ones? I know of the Thran, replied Misha. An ancient race they were, which predated all other living races in the land of Tarisir. They left no bones of themselves, but they left the bones of their machines across the deserts. Bones you outlanders pick at like vultures, snapped the Kadir. Hajar saw Misha hesitate for a moment. When he spoke, the scholar chose his words carefully. Those nations of the eastern coast seek to understand which has come before, the better to understand what is to be. The Kadir made a grumbling noise that sounded like an unsettled stomach. There are some things that are best not known. The old ones may discover you picking through their garbage and punish you for your effrontery and punish us for not stopping you. Another silence from Misha. Then the Argivian said, 
as you say, most eminent one. He did not look down, and his face was an impassive mask. Hajar could detect not a trace of sarcasm. Neither could the Kadir. He leaned back on his pillows and snatched a huge metal wine cup from its tray. So, you are a scholar? he inquired. I am but a student, returned Mitra, but I have much knowledge. You know your philology well, said the chieftain. Misha shrugged. I had good teachers. It was one more tool in learning the past. The Kadir rumbled again. Hajar had already surmised that the leader of the Sawardi had little time for or interest in the past. You know the outlander languages? Orgaiv, Corlys, and Yotian? He spat the last name like a curse. They are one and the same language, said Misha calmly, though there are differences in dialect and accent. The dialects diverged over centuries due to... The Kadir held up a hand, and the young man was immediately silenced. You know your calculations? I do. I have nine patrols of eight men each. How many men do I have? asked the Kadir. Seventy-two, replied Misha immediately. Four of those patrols are mounted on horseback. How many legs are there? said the Kadir with a harsh smile. Two hundred and seventy-two, returned the Argaivan smoothly, apparently without thinking. The Kadir's face darkened again, and he looked at Hajar. The younger Falaji thought for a long moment, his fingers twitching as he sorted mounted and unmounted troops and number of legs of each. Then he nodded. The Kadir regarded the stocky slave with stony eyes. You will do. To the guards, he said, Take him out and bathe him. To Mishra, he said, Rakik, you will be my son's tutor. Teach him to speak your language and master his calculations. Do this, and you will be treated well. Fail me, and you will be killed. Misha rose and bowed deeply. As your will is merciful, eminent one. The two guards fight Misha again, and one of them still carried the hobbles. The other put a hand on Misha's shoulder. The stocky Argyvan turned and left without saying a word. Hajar noted that throughout the entire conversation, the young Kadir, the smaller version of his father, had said nothing and seemed no more interested in his new tutor than in anything else in the tent. Hajar had left the Argyvan's camp when the last of the Outlander students had fled back to their coastal lowlands and the bits of metal they had excavated had been carefully shipped away on ox-drawn carts. He wanted them all to come with him, but the old digger chose to remain in the area. Hajar joined one band of nomads, and then another, finally finding his way to the Kadir's camp. A distant relation on each one's mother's side gave him tentative entrance, and his hard work and bravery in a raid against a merchant caravan cemented the young Falaji's position within the camp hierarchy. But now he had taken a risk, recommending one of Tokasia's students as the young Kadir's tutor. His own fortunes would be tied to those of the Argivi now, and Mishra's failure would be considered his own. Hajar visited Mishra's new quarters, a small open tarp near the cooks, whenever he could. When Mishra was not teaching, he was expected to aid in the preparation of meals. Simple, lumpish tasks such as fetching wood, tending the fire, and butchering meat for smoking. At first, things did not go too well. At 10 years old, the young Kadir had no more interest in language and calculations than his father did. Worse, he seemed utterly repelled by the idea of being taught by anyone, particularly an outlander. Mishra, for his part, was desolate. I'll be back to digging ditches within a fortnight, he said one evening to Hajar, as he hobbled to gather more brush to tuck into the fire pit. Hajar knew better. To fail the Kandir did not result in demotion, but in death. Neither he nor Mishra had asked if there had been previous tutors, but the implication was that there had been. There were Argivian books in the young Kadir's quarters, as well as an abacus. Both books and abacus had apparently been untouched by the chieftain's son's hands. He does not want to learn, said Misha firmly, and I will not spend my days speaking to a wall. Yargavian let out a deep sigh. All he cares about is battle and the great things his father has done and what he will do when he becomes Kadir. Perhaps I could speak with the Kadir, said Hajar, then shook his head at the foolishness of his own idea. The father cared even less about knowledge than his son, except he demanded that his son know what he did not. It was a demand with the steel edge of a swordmaster's blade. At best, he fidgets, resumed Misha. At worst, he sleeps. I once prodded him awake, and he had his guards beat me. The stocky scholar rubbed his shoulder. It is not something I want to do again. I am sorry it is not working out the way I had hoped, said Hajar. I as well, returned the scholar. And it just seems so hopeless. I feel empty inside, empty and useless. Indeed, the Argivian looked as if he had not slept for some time. It could not be the work, thought Hajar, 
for his life was slightly easier in that regard. It had to be something else. Perhaps his own sense of failure gnawed at him. Hajar was silent for a moment, then said, Why did you learn Falaji? Misha looked up at the younger man. What? Hajar continued, Your Gavin woman knew our language, but she had to deal with them all and the other diggers. None of the Outlander students seemed particularly interested in learning more than the curse words. Your brother never learned, as far as I know. But you did. Why? My brother was interested in devices, in things, said Misha warily. I have always found people more interesting. There were people among the Argivan students, said Ajar. Why did you learn our language? Misha shrugged his shoulders. I suppose I wanted to hear the old legends of your people. The genie nations, the heroes, and the princesses. The dragons you called Mokfawa, and the warriors. When they were put in my language, the stories always seemed dry, shriveled things, bloodless and lifeless. They meant more in their original tongue. And don't you outlanders have your own legends? asked Hajar. Old battles and legends? Well, of course, said Mishra. There was the tale of the great pirate who raided the Coralist coast, and of the warrior queen of Argive who lived 500 years ago. There are all manner of old god stories that they only believe in Yodia and other backward nations. Hajar smiled. Perhaps your young charge would rather hear about those stories instead, and that might encourage him to learn the language as well. And put your calculations and lessons in terms of things he understands, continued Hajar. Remember the question that Kadir put to you? Probably that was how he learned his ciphers and fractions. Misha did not say anything for a moment, but stared into the cook fire. You might be right, he said at last. It's worth a try at least. Worth a try for both of our sakes, said Hajar. He added, Also, you can teach him how to curse in Argivian. I'm sure the boy would like that as well. Several months passed. Things seemed to go better for the Argivian scholar, and Hajar allowed himself to relax. If anything went wrong at this late date, it was unlikely that he would now be remembered and blamed for recommending the young man's tutor. Indeed, Misha's lessons, now couched in Argivian history and Yodian mythology, seemed to have more than their desired effect on the young Kadir. He had gathered a basic feel for the Outlander's language and had professed even an interest in Argivian customs beyond the battlefield. The youth's temper toward his slave tutor had improved as well, and the beatings became less frequent then disappeared entirely. Nor, according to Mishra, did the youth sleep in class anymore. Indeed, the young Kadir seemed almost to warm to the Argavian scholar, and oft times now, Mishra was spared from his cleaning duties in order to finish a tale begun earlier in the afternoon. One evening, Mishra had asked Hajar to attend as the young Kadir recited the tale of the Great Pirate and the Last Sea of Dragons. There were about a dozen attending, but only Hajar and Mishra understood what the boy was saying fully. He would tell part of the tale in Argavian, then speak again in Falaji. The flashy versions were much more florid, obscene, and bloody in their descriptions, but Misha did not correct the youth. Soon afterward, Misha's hobbles were removed, though he still was expected to tend the cooking fires when not in the young Kadir's company. Hajar's own life went well. Many of the local tribes swore fealty to the Swarti. The clan's raids had become more effective and the tribes more prosperous. Merchant caravans were held for tolls, and in some cases, outright ransom. Several Argarvian settlements on Falaji land were removed by fire and sword. When the Argivians sent their slow, heavy armored patrols in Sawari land seeking retribution, the more nimble Falaji had evaded them. So it was with some surprise when Hajar, following one such raid, was summoned to the Kadir's tent. Save for the ceremonial guards, no one else was present. The Kadir leaned back on his pillows, turning something large and green in his figures. Hajar entered, knelt in respect, and waited. You know the Rakik tutor, said the Kadir presently. He did not look in Hajar's direction. I do, said Hajar rising after being addressed. He suddenly wondered how much he should admit regarding Mishra. He has done well, said the Kadir. The boy knows his additions and subtractions, his ciphers and fractions, and he speaks Outlander passively well, I am told. Very well indeed, said Hajar. I have heard him speak, and his words are well formed and proper. The boy is doing well, said the Kadir. Perhaps too well. The Kadir let the statement fall into silence. Finally, Hajar said cautiously, how so, most eminent one? The Kadir held up the green object to his eye, regarding it as a merchant inspects his stock. Do you know what this is? Hajar had never seen it before, but he knew at once what it was, one of the power stones that Tokasia and the brothers had always made a fuss over. It still held its energy, for it glowed with a bright jade sheen. This one glowed, even though it had been broken, sheared along one side. Hajar thought about one of the stories around the diggers' fires after the brothers returned from the secret heart. 
of the pouch that Misha kept around his neck. Carefully, he chose his words. It looks like an eye of the old ones, he said, using the Falaji word for the power stone. The Kadir grumbled, making the low, camel-about-to-spit sound that so unsettled Hajar. Indeed, there are Argivians and Yotians as well, trespassing into the desert looking for trinkets such as these. What do you know about this particular one? Hajar was silent, attempting to gather his thoughts, but the Kadir pressed on. This one was taken from the Rakik Tudor when he was captured. It was put among my treasures and forgotten. But my son asked about it the other day, and I had brought it out. Why does my son request it? Hajar was silent for a moment, hoping that it was another rhetorical question. It was not. At last he ventured. Probably the tutor mentioned it to him, and he was curious. The Kadir gave a low hum and said, And perhaps he wants it back, eh? Now why would the Rakik want this particular stone? Perhaps it has special meaning to him, replied Hajar quickly. Look at the way it's cut along one side. Shattered, not cut, returned the Kadir shrewdly. And shattered eyes are often useless and dull. This one holds whatever fire the old ones imbued with it, so this may be special. The question is, how special is it? Hajar thought of that last night in the Argivian camp and the unearthly lights that had shone from the brothers' cabin. The stones, Tokasi had said. She'd said something about the stones. Then, there had been the blast and the fire, and Misha had disappeared into the desert until Hajar had found him digging a ditch in the Kadir's camp. He never asked what really happened that night. He had assumed it was something that Misha's older brother, the lean spooky one, had done. Hajar gulped for a moment, then said, I cannot say, respected one. The Kadir made that low gurgling noise again, and said, Neither can I, and for that reason, I will deny it to my son, so he is not tempted to pass it into the hands of the Rakik. I will keep it myself, and see if it carries any power of the old ones. He slipped the gem into a voluminous pocket of his vest and shifted position, facing Hajar fully now. He laced his fingers before his face and said, The question now is, why would the boy ask for something on behalf of the Rakik? Hajar stammered, then said, It could be that your son heard of the stone from the Rakik and wanted it for his own. The Kadir tilted his head for a moment, as if considering that option for the first time. Perhaps, he said, shaking his head. Or perhaps he wanted to retrieve it for his friend and tutor. Hajar searched for the proper words. A Kadir's son would never be friends with an outlander Rakik. Agree, replied the Kadir. My fear, though, is that he listens to the outlander too much. He leans on him, as a man leans on a crutch. And if one leans too often, one forgets how to walk on one's own. Hajar said softly, I do not think you need to fear that occurring. I fear nothing, said the Kadir quickly. But now the boy will ride on our raids as well. He is young, but not too young to learn a man's craft of battle. He will be taught when he is in camp. But otherwise, the Rakik will only have the cook fires to worry about. Tell me, if he spends his time on our raids, will the boy still know enough by the end of next year to be considered educated? Hajar thought for a moment. The Kadir's son was now more knowledgeable than most of the Sawarian camp. But somehow, he felt that was the wrong answer. Instead, he spoke most of the truth. By the end of next year. Yes, he would. The Kadir leaned back on his pillows. Excellent. When the boy comes of his majority, he will no longer need the crutch. And when the time comes, that crutch will be broken and cast aside. Do I make myself clear? Hajar looked into the Kadir's porting eyes. It was very clear indeed. The Kadir worried about his son's loyalties. When the time came, Misha would be taken out into the desert and killed quietly. Hajar would oversee that slant on the Kadir's command. Hajar heard himself say, as you wish, respected one. Your words are as law. The Kadir waved him off, and Hajar knelt briefly, then fled the tent. Hajar's mouth felt as if it had been filled with dust. He had heard the Kadir's death warrant, and he knew if he disobeyed, he would be signing his own. And for what? A pack of fatherly fears and half a stone. Hajar walked past the prince's tent and saw, through the opening, Misha and the young Kadir talking. Their voices were low, but they frequently broke apart and laughed, sharing private jokes. The Kadir's son motioned, and Misha poured drinks. He lifted his cup and joined the young Kadir in a toast of Nabis. Hajar frowned. Perhaps the old Kadir was not wrong in his worries about his son. Perhaps as a youth, the Kadir himself had had a friend upon whom he depended, and who mysteriously disappeared one day. Perhaps, thought Hajar, that was the nature of being a leader. One relies on others, but one does not depend utterly on them. Hajar decided to walk back to his own quarters the long way around. He would not tell Misha, and he could not tell the Kadir's son. He would hope that once the lad had more battle experience, 
he would be less interested in the scholar's teachings. With that diminished interest, the Kadir's fears and the death sentence would vanish. Unlikely, thought Hajar, but possible. After all, a lot could happen before the end of the next year. Misha dreamed. As his body healed from its beatings and his spirit recovered from its daily exhaustion, Misha's dreams grew stronger. Sometimes he dreamed of Tokasia, sometimes of his brother, but most often he dreamed of the stone, as it sang to him out of the darkness. He told the Kadir son of the stone, and the boy had discovered that, yes, his father still had it in his possession. Misha knew this already, for the stone held him to the camp as no hobbles ever could. So he dreamed of the stone, imagined it spinning in space, singing its plaintive dirge, crying out to him. He wanted it back. He wanted to go get it. And in his dreams, he went. In the dream, he woke and realized he was somewhere else, far from the Sawari encampment, far from the desert itself, far from the world. The sky above him was not filled with the familiar Falaji stars, the thick light dotted soup of the night sky. Instead, it was overcast and dark, flickering with diffused pulses of lightning. He could see it in the darkness, and he realized he was atop a low, bare tor, surrounded by thick vegetation. He heard the singing of his gem in the distance, and he moved toward it. The vegetation around the bare hillock was thick and tangled, but he moved through it as if he were a wraith. It was a riot of bright yellows and oranges against dark leaves. He paused and saw the leaves themselves had a strange sheen, as if they had been stampled from steel plates. The flowers as well were metallic and dripped foul-smelling ether instead of nectar. He touched one of the leaves, and it reverberated to his touch. Its keening matched that of the stone, and he ignored the leaf, following the heart-tugging wail of his gem. He made a detour around a great pool with an oily film dancing around the surface. He looked away for a moment, and something large and black surfaced in the pond, then dived again. When he looked back, he saw only slowly spreading rings rippling out toward the borders. The water moved oddly, as if it were made of something thicker and more syrupy than ordinary water. He found a clear-shelled egg, and for a moment, thought it was his missing gem. On closer inspection, he saw that the hand-sized egg was a translucent shell, and within the shell, a small gold-colored creature was growing. No, not growing, he realized, being assembled. Smaller golden creatures were moving spans and joints around within the shell, assembling like one of Urza's devices. As he watched, the thin form of a lizard skin and skull appeared in the murky darkness of the egg. Then the singing began again. He set the egg down and followed the siren call. It began to rain, and the rain tasted like tears, leaving oil streaked patch on his clothing. He followed the song. Finally, he reached the building, appeared among the jungle of metal plates. The building's architecture seemed familiar. It was made of ropey roots and metallic cables. There were markings along the side of the building, but in his dream, he could not decipher them. The plants had pulled their trailing roots away from the base of the pyramid, and Misha saw a set of stairs leading upward to a small alcove. Within that cave shone the greenish light of the power stone. Yes, he had seen this type of building before. He had been inside one, once in a hallway lined with mirrors, when he first gained the stone, the stone that now waited for him. There was a loud metallic crash to his right, among the thick serrated leaves. A huge brass head erupted from the surrounding vegetation. At first, Misha thought it was a giant serpent, for it had a huge triangular head mounted at the end of a looping metallic neck. Then the beast emerged fully, and Misha saw the neck was moored to a huge elephantine body with leonin paws ending in sharp steel claws. It was a dragon, but a mechanical one, crafted by unknown hands and granted inhuman life. Its eyes were dull, flickering blue gems. Steam vented from its nostrils and leaked from its joints. It was an engine built in the shape of a great wire. The dragon engine saw Misha and let out a low, challenging bellow. Then it began to move forward, half loping, half slithering from its jungle hiding place. Misha froze for a moment, but only for a moment. Then he fled up the stairs, toward his lost gem. His dream logic told him that if he reached the gem, everything would be fine. The stairs seemed to elongate endlessly, and his feet were suddenly mired in tar. Still, he pressed upward, feeling the hot breath of the dragon engine behind him. Finally, he reached the top of the steps, and his fingers closed around the green gem. At the first touch of the gem, a wave of peace washed over Misha, and he forgot the steam-dripping engine behind him. When he did turn, the creature was no longer trying to scale the stairs to reach him. Instead, it lay along the lengths of the steps. Its ears were laid back along its head, and its eyes flickered, not with rage, but with obedience. Steam dribbled weakly from its nostrils. It was waiting for him to tell it what to do. Misha held up the gem, and its light bathed the creature fully. It was truly a mechanical engine in dragon form. Its forelegs were like that of a dragon, but instead of rear limbs, it possessed a set of link plates curled over a collection of smaller wheels. Treads, thought Misha. The device carried with it a continual road that could be laid before it and picked up afterward. It made perfect sense.
Interesting. Someone said the word, and Misha wheeled around. No one spoke again, but Misha heard the word echoing in his mind. There above the alcove was perched the mirror figure from his earlier vision, a creature of bones, armor, horns, and tendrils. Somehow, Misha knew this was more than just another construct. With its exposed muscles of rope-like cables and its backward-pointing horns, it was a living thing, a powerful one, and unlike the engine, it would not be cowed by the power of the stone. The creature perched over the alcove regarded Misha for a long moment. The young man was dimly aware that the long tresses along the creature's horns were more like draped tentacles and moved on its own volition. Then the creature laughed at Misha, a dry, hollow laugh, the laugh of a skeleton. Give me the stone, shouted the creature, and leapt on top of him. Misha screamed. He tried to wake himself up, tried to force himself to run, tried to force the dragon engine to defend him, but the horned creature laughed, and Misha felt its claw-like grip close around his own hand, the one holding the gem. There was a wrenching pain along his arm as the creature pulled the gem away, taking Misha's arm with it. Misha screamed and woke again. He was in his tent, the open-sided tarp pitched near the cooking fire. One of the guards was by the fire, looking at him, but not moving either to help or to punish. Misha looked at his left arm. It was still there, though there were some streaks of red along its length, as if a briar had worn its way along its length, or as if claws had grabbed it. His fist was clenched tightly. Slowly, Misha opened his fingers. There was no green gem at the center of his hand. There was nothing at all. Misha took a deep breath. It was a dream. More savage and lifelike than before, but still a dream. He exhaled slowly. Then the ground beneath him began to shake. Hajar was on guard duty that night, but at the far perimeter of the camp. One of the survivors later said he heard the young Kadir's Rakik cry out a curse before the abyss yawned open and released its hell creature. But that could have been something added after the fact. So much of what happened that night was later embellished. At first, Hajar thought it was nothing more than a night tremor, a shifting of the sands cooling after the hot summer heat. Sometimes, a ripple like that traveled thousands of miles from the Sardinian Mountains all the way to Zegon. Some said such tremors were omens. But then, in the desert, anything the least bit unusual was assumed to be an omen. But a night tremor lasted for a moment, perhaps two, then subsided. This one persisted for a full ten seconds, then it grew stronger. Already, the camp was reacting to the assault. The goats rushed from one end of their pen to the other, looking for some means of escape. Several of the horses, tethered for the evening, pulled at the reins, trying to escape. There were shots among the camp, as guards called to each other, and sleeping Falaji awoke to find the earth rippling about them. Hajar shouted, but did not know if he made any noise. Already, the roar of the earth was more than his ears could take. Tents came loose from their moorings and collapsed. The low fence around the goat pen was shaken free, and the goats, a flurry of white and gray, bounded to freedom. The horses pulled their pegs loose from the ground and flooded to the night. Then the Mokfawa escaped from its earthen prison and boarded up through the center of the camp. It was a dragon of the old legends. Its head, a wedge-shaped spike that effortlessly plowed from the ground, followed by a chain-like neck, and finally, a great body made of metal ribs. It took a moment for that to sink in on Hajar. The Mokfawa was made entirely of metal, its brass hide shining in the moonlight. Several of the guards were already fleeing, but more were rushing toward the monstrosity. The creature had appeared from below, near the center of the camp, near the Kadir's tent. In some phalaji, that inspired loyalty, and others, fear. Hajar felt nothing more than life-saving caution. Gripping his spear, he spiraled around the perimeter of the camp, hoping to pick up some reinforcements before charging the beast. Some of his brethren would not wait to gain allies, and were already attacking the creature. In response, it snaked its head down in a leisurely gesture, and snagged one of the attacking men. Its jaws closed on the head and shoulders of the attacker, and the warrior screamed. The scream continued as the dragon snapped its head up like a whip, opening its jaw as the head reached its highest point of the arc and releasing its attacker. The scream sailed over Hajar's head and was suddenly cut short when the warrior landed in the darkness beyond the camp. Other warriors were attacking now, but their curved swords and barbed sawardi spears had no more effect than if it were trying to hack through a stone wall. The dragon's head darted forward again and came up with the struggling form of another warrior. This one shook back and forth like one of the Kadir's dogs tormenting a hare. It flung that man away as well, and slowly climbed the rest of the way out of its pit. Hajar wanted to charge as well, as many of the warriors were doing, to protect their Kadir and their camp, to gain revenge against the creature. But the part of him that worked for Amal, in the Argivian woman's camp, knew what the thing had to be, and who would best know how to handle it. He found Misha huddled beneath his tarp, curled into a small ball. The dream, he muttered, his eyes welded shut. The dream. It seemed to Hajar, as if the youth were trying to wish the creature away. 
It's real, snapped Hajar, adding in Argivian. It is a device, an artifact. You know about such devices. How do we defeat it? The outlander's words seemed to pull the scholar from his panic. Of course, he said slowly. It has to be a device. Perhaps not Thrain, but still a device. I must have the stone. Stone? said Hajar, a sick feeling growing in the pit of his stomach. A green gem cut in half, said Meesher quickly. They took it from me when I first came here. With it, I could weaken the dragon engine. I've seen it, said Hajar, turning toward the battle. Quali, he added, the Kadir has it. Hajar looked across the devastation that the dragon engine had already created. Women, children, and elderly were already fleeing the camp, while the warriors had regrouped for another assault. The Falaji youth saw the broad figure of the Kadir among them. There was a flash of green against the Kadir's broad chest. There! Hajar pointed to the large figure of the Sawardi chieftain. He has it! He did not wait to see if Mishra was following, but leapt forward into the fray. Hajar was about 200 paces behind the main mass of men, led by the Kadir. His position saved his life. The dragon engine leaned forward and opened its mouth in front of the charging concentration of men. There was the sound of a whirlwind within the great beast's body, and it breathed a gout of red ting steam. Hajar heard the screams ahead of him as the billowing cloud enfolded the warriors. He felt the heat and staggered back a few paces, then charged forward again into the quickly dissipating cloud. The men had been cooked where they stood, their flesh peeled back and charred by the heat. Hajar felt bile rising in his throat, but he looked around for a large form, a form that had to be the Kadir. Hajar found him face down in the dirt, a growing pool of blood beneath his body from where the steam had disintegrated the Kadir's skin down to the bone. Cursing the task, Hajar knelt next to the old man's corpse and began rifling his pockets. Hajar looked up only once to see an assault led by the Kadir's son make a minimal impact on the creature's armored hide. The Kadir had been true to his word and kept the stone close to him. It glowed now, reflecting the embers of the charred flesh around it. Hajar grabbed the stone and made the mistake of looking up again. He stared directly into the eyes and maw of the monk Fawa. There was thought behind those eyes, Hajar realized. This was not like the Su Chi or the plodding onlets of the Argivian camp. There was an intelligence within those eyes and a malignancy behind that intelligence. The muck fowl looked at Hajar and knew in an instant who he was, what he was holding in his hands, and why he could not use it. The dragon opened its mouth, and there was the sound of the desert wind again. Hajar knew what to expect next, and bolted for the perimeter of the camp. His back blazed as the passing cloud of steam dissipated around him. Then, he was free of it, and saw Mishra approaching from the other direction. Hajar looked back. The muck fowl was already breaking loose of its bank of steam. It lumbered forward toward them. Hajar turned and tossed the half stone at Misha. Then he jumped aside, covering his face with his arms, on the chance that Misha did not truly know what to do to defeat the dragon engine. Maybe, he thought desperately, the dragon would think him dead and pass him by. For a long moment, Hajar held his position. At any moment, he expected to feel the dragon's wrath. When it did not come, he slowly moved his hands away from his face. The muck foe was supine, looking for all the world like one of the Kadir's, no, Hajar reminded himself, the late Kadir's, dogs. Its steel talon paws were drawn up under its forward haunches, and Hajar noted that instead of rear feet, it had a curious set of wheels and plates. The dragon engine's neck was bolt straight and lying flat on the ground, an arrow with the beast's metallic snout as its head. Steamlets of reddish steam hissed from the corners of its closed mouth. At the point of the arrow stood Mishra, holding the green half gem aloft. In his hand, the power stone was shining brightly, a beacon in the night. Hajar stood and staggered over to the scholar. Did you kill it? he asked. Misha shook his head, and his voice sounded distant. No, this is different. It is not weakened by me. I think it obeys me. There were shouts, and Hajar saw the young Kadir approaching. He was bleeding from the nasty cut along one arm, and his red face looked as if he caught part of the steam cloud. Is it dead? He shouted at Misha. Subdued, replied the scholar. I think I can control it now. The young Kadir nodded and said, my father will be pleased. Hajar started, then spoke. I am sorry, young one, but your father is... He let his voice trail off. You are Kadir now. As he spoke, he saw a veil come down over the young Kadir's face. It was as if the news had turned the youth to stone, had petrified his features. His face suddenly seemed harder than it had moments before when he was just the son of the Kadir. The new Kadir nodded and turned to Mishra. You can control this thing? It was a blunt question. I believe I can, said Mishra. Can anyone else? asked the young chieftain. Mishra thought for a moment, then shook his head. 
I believe that if your father could have, he would. Then another pause. We can check later. Agreed, said the young Kadir. Take this thing away from the camp for the moment, and remain with it until morning. To Ajar, he said, Take me to my father's body. We must inspect the wound and see how much damage has been done. We have lost much this night. He looked at the dragon engine thoughtfully, and said as much to himself as to Hajar. But perhaps we have gained much as well. Hajar and Misha hesitated for only a moment, but it was enough to earn the reproach from the new Kadir of the Sawardi, chieftain of the Falaji tribes. Get moving! Misha said softly, As you wish, most revered one. I remain your Rakik. No, said the young man, holding up a hand in the same manner as his father had months before. His face softened for a new moment. You are no longer Rakik, a slave. I make you now Raki, my wizard. I will need you at my side, with this amazing device. With it, we can maintain our hold over the other tribes and gain new ones as well. Will you serve me willingly? Misha dropped to one knee and said, Of course. Hajar was impressed as well. The boy acted as if he had been preparing for this moment and knew exactly what had to be done. Thank you, said the youth to Misha. Truly, your mother and my mother must have shared a common mother. But right now, let's hurry. We have much yet to do this night.